<laughs> yeah, very nice. Thank you very much. So, as lots of you know, um, there are some foundational um, techniques and structures in Flow which um, make NEOS and Flow very suitable for cloud environments. Uh, one one part of, 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 of course, is the resources framework, which has different plugins uh, to allow you storing resources uh, in some cloud storage. And generally, um, NEOS works very well in containers and can be scaled and so on. So, we've seen NEOS in the wild in all kinds of different cloud scenarios in Azure, in Google Cloud Platform in the Open Telecom Cloud, and also uh, in AWS, of course. And the next talk will be from Ernesto Bashni. And uh, Ernesto was born in Sao Paulo in the same year, year then, uh, as I, and moved to Germany after school in 1996. He studied computer science in Stuttgart, where he still um, is with his company. I never stopped working with web technologies ever since, and aside of work, he lives with his wife and his two kids. And at home, he speaks Portuguese with his family, and probably also drinking a galao once in a while, trying to keep the language alive for his kids. So, enjoy Ernesto's talk, highly scalable NEOS with AWS and NEOS. Hi, this is Ernesto from Conity in Stuttgart. It's a pleasure to be at the NeosCon 2021, the virtual edition. Today I'm going to talk about running a Neos or a Flow application in AWS and being fully scalable using Docker containers. If during my presentation you have any thoughts or questions, don't hesitate to take notes and ask me them after my presentations, because we will have a time slot for a couple of minutes to talk about it in real life. So now let's get started and have fun. So let's get started with it. Uh, my presentation about scalable nails on AWS. First, a little bit about me. I am Ernesto. I work at Conit, a small agency here in southern of Germany. I have been working with the web for several years now, I think more than 25 years. I'm, I have a technical background, so we are a web agency, but uh, basically we work on a technical level. I've been working with Typo3 for since 2012. I've been in a Typo3 core team, I've been a release manager of Typo3. And lately, in the last seven years, we've been using Neos and Flow also for our customer projects. And we have a couple of them and a couple of big ones also. I'm also an open source enthusiast, so you find me on GitHub. You can uh, contact me via Twitter. And basically, I'm open for discussions around this topic and every other topic that's related to Neos, Flow, uh, scaling application, DevOps themes. That's, that's my main area of interest. Um, so much about applications, running Neos applications on the web. I start with the status quo. Where do we come from? How do you host a Neos application? Well, you contact your hosting provider 
and to say I, we need this server and he provides you with a fast server basically uh, where you install your web server you install your php it has a file system it has mysql database probably on the same server uh, and you run it and your application runs smoothly and everything is great and your customers and your users are happy with it but then people start uh, liking your application and more access start hitting your page and the server is not fast and not enough anymore what do you do ba basically you grow it you rent a bigger server or you add more memory to it or more, more cpu power Basically, you scale it vertically. Vertically scaling means add more ho horsepower to the existing server. Of course, uh, as you can understand, there are limits to that. The vertical growing is uh, limited to the maximum amount of hardware that one server can contain. Can pretty much, can be pretty uh, fast, but is limited. What can you do next? see ah, mysql is there on this server maybe you can put it on a separate server okay let's do that then you have a second server or maybe even a cluster of servers running your mysql applications and then you have a super fast server which has norm, no, now more power to run the, the application itself uh, now you start optimizing your application and you'd figure out the caching that might be an issue or searching the nodes in your application as an issue what you do, you add more components to that. You can even do that on separate uh, servers, like a Redis uh, for caching or Elasticsearch for searching nodes in your application. Well, you do that and mainly I put this number one behind there because mainly you give them the servers names. Even if you orchestrate them and uh, with Ansible or with Chef, basically you treat the servers as pets. And this is uh, where it came from too. We have servers. We had even name schemes calling the servers uh, uh, from lettuces names like uh, spinach or uh, kohlrabi. But uh, this is the past. So how can we scale even further? And not even further, but how can we start scaling at all? How can we uh, stop simply growing our hardware requirements uh, when our application grows? First of all, we have to start from the beginning. Start to understand your application. What is the need of your application? Where is it? Where are the bottlenecks? Where do you need to scale at all? We've seen there are several components here already. So basically we have the MySQL part. Is it needed to scale this MySQL part in a your names flow application? And in our experience, usually it isn't. There is not much where you can uh, optimize in a MySQL level. Of course, you can optimize the queries you do in your application code to uh, use indexes or uh, to make it uh, to make the queries pretty fast. But basically, this is not the major point where, you, where our application are hitting the service, the MySQL requirements. Caching uh, is the second part. You cache using a file system usually, and then you discover that it's not fast enough and you scale out for using redis so you have a have a uh, you cache stored on redis and maybe even the sessions third component would be searching for nodes you have a super fast uh, starting page but it's very dynamic because it contains teasers fetched from all over the place and from nodes all over your huge amount of node tree we have installations, uh, for example, in one of our installations is the Deutsche Apotheca Zeitung, which has, has almost one million nodes. So rendering the, uh, the main page is basically a mission of fetching nodes from, the, from this node repository. And this is not doable in a scalable way with MySQL only and Neos and Flow. So as soon as you have more than 1000 nodes or so, we'll start, uh, you will need Elasticsearch to do the business of fetching the nodes. So this is a component where you cannot, uh, uh, where, where you, which you will need uh, very soon. The second part, apart from the application itself, it, how it works in the different areas of the application is, how does the application grow uh, temporarily uh, with, uh, with, uh, with time? What are the requirements in a new application um, throughout the day, for example? 
in a usual application, and this is an example of an application uh, of our DZ web page for one week, we see there peaks and lows. Of course, in, at night in German time, no one accesses the pages, only the crawlers, basically. And during the day, the access is very frequent. For example, at midday, people go to to lunch break and start reading our page. And then uh, there are some situations when, for example, our daily newsletter hits the 20,000 users. And there is an article that, which is very interesting and uh, people are interesting. It generates a peak because people are start accessing it more often. Or imagine even further, you have a TV commercial where we put, put on the web page uh, a URL in the, in the commercial. Or we make a Facebook advertising for millions of users and suddenly this advertising hits and people start going to your page. So we have peaks. And uh, in the traditional way, you have to uh, scale your server for the peak. So basically the hardware will have to cope with the, furthest, uh, the, 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 the biggest peak you have. And the remaining part of the day, or maybe at the night, the server will be bored at hell. So it's you have a, a huge waste of resources which are not really using as well. So let's try uh, try to abstract away from MySQL, Redis, and Elasticsearch for a bit and focus on the web serving part or for the application part, which is basically the web server and the Neos PHP application. If we consider that as, as a, a worker, a unit of worker, wouldn't it be cool if we could simply uh, add another, wor another worker or many workers uh, to cope with the amount of load throughout the day or maybe grow, scale it uh, uh, throughout the year? This is called horizontal scaling because uh, basically you're not adding horsepower on top of your existing service, but you are adding more servers uh, to cope with different loads. Um, horizontal growing, uh, growing has of course a huge benefit because it can grow endlessly. So as soon as you have this concept in place, you can grow uh, as, as much as you want without having to uh, yeah, cope to a different technique. So this is interesting, and uh, we talk. What where would be that workers unit? In a traditional way, that will be servers. So okay, add new servers. So you have the fast server one, then you add the fast server two and fast server three, and then you somehow with the load balancer cluster them together. That would be too easy or too not fun at all, because we've doing that also for years now. And we are developers and we love Docker. So we thought we have been using Docker for several years now in, for development. A developer loves Docker because you can on a local machine uh, simulate uh, uh, an environment that combine different techniques and the different, different services on your local machine in order to develop your application. So for example, uh, you have a, a description file. This is a Docker Compose, which is part of your project describing which PHP version you want, which Nginx version you want, uh, database version, and then you combine them together, they network, and you are able to create a, a running application out of containers, which are described through a YAML file in this case, and uh, be able to abstract away from that. You don't have to care, you just have to know it's there and it works. It's very easy uh, for uh, new new developers to join a company, just start up a project and it's running locally. Why can we do that in production also? Just start an application by running containers. Wouldn't it be easy? Well, it could be easy if there were not, uh, if we, but we have to think about certain things. Um, so we now know how Docker runs in development and we now know also how we run our service on production. So to combine these two, we have some, um, the, the, we have some problems that we need to solve. First one is logging. Uh, we know about uh, how our service log, we have syslog, we have uh, uh, tools to collect the metrics and, and send them to a central logging location. 
Uh, but in, in a Docker environment, you have Docker containers. How do they lock? How can we ca get access to locks that they generate? Second problem uh, or second situation to solve backups. How do we do backups in this scenario? What do we need to uh, backup from the containers? Do we need to backup them at all? Monitoring. Another thing that has been solved for years now, and we are using it uh, tools for monitoring the servers for years. You're using uh, tools like uh, um, Telegraph or Nagios and plugins that monitor the, the CPU and the heartbeat of, of your application and provide and creating graphs for that. We need this in a Docker environment where you don't have the service anymore. Operating system with updates. How do you update the operating system or the tools coming with the operating system? It's also a problem in production uh, if you have a single server because the service also has uh, the need updates in the operating system and it's even more difficult to solve this problem. So this is a particular problem that is even nicer, nicely solved with the Docker environment, as we will see later on. Deployment. Deployment is another task that we do all the time. We will want to ship new code because our application is constantly being updated. We know how to deploy on a production server like a, a regular hardware server. You, we have tools to do that. We have tons of tools. We have Surf, we have Anzistrano, we have Capistrano, we have uh, yeah, plenty of, of choices. Everyone do their own uh, uh, job. Basically moving files from your installation or for, from your development to the production server and maybe switching directories or any, or running some scripts after that. So basically, this kind of tools, they don't really uh, matter or work on a Docker environment because you don't have a file system anymore, as we will see later how the deployment works. A trivial, a trivial thing could be uh, how to send mails. Uh, usually you have a server, then you can you install Postfix, you have a mail queue and mails are getting out. But in Docker, you don't have a server. How do you send out mails? And um, if you need, if you have really the need to send plenty of mails, like a newsletter, for example, how to do that in a Docker workflow? And at, uh, last, last but not least, how to scale that uh, in this Docker environment? So many of the things can be solved in uh, about thinking about our application and solving that in our application. Some of the things can be solved by using existing tools that orchestrate Docker in the cloud. Um, so in order to uh, run your Docker, Docker application on the production, we have plenty of choices nowadays. The most common or uh, the most known choice nowadays is a Kubernetes. It's open source. It's a tool set for, uh, to, to manage your containers in production. There is being open source, there's no lock in, so you're not locked into a specific vendor. So you have freedom to choose the cloud provider you want, or you can even choose to host it on your own, on your own server infrastructure if you want. And there are several cloud providers providing this Kubernetes, uh, managed Kubernetes uh, service already, like AVS, uh, Google, or Azure. So you can choose one of them and you can even switch from one to the other if you're not satisfied with the service for the other. Um, what we did and what we chose to uh, was to use the AWS, AWS specific service to orchestrate containers on a cloud, which is called ECS, Elastic Container Service. The main benefit for us would, uh, is that it works well and it fits together with all the good services that we already know and knew before. Uh, and they can be combined in a very harmonic way and manner. This provides some benefits for us um, to orchestrate this in combination with other services that we run in AWS. For example, it works very well with Route 53, which is the DNS services, with v uh, VPC, the networking layer of uh, the AWS for networking, security, for VPNs and stuff like that. It works very well with the Elastic load balancing and the application load balancing tool set of the AWS. So you, uh, the auto scaling works out of the box with that. 
works very well with CloudWatch, which is the monitoring and the metrics gathering and displaying of, of graphs uh, in the AWS world. And we can use the cloud formation for, to orchestrate everything and to basically prepare our, our whole infrastructure as a code. Well, cloud formation is a language where you describe your AWS infrastructure as YAML files. So I will choose the route. Uh, I will. I can only explain you how to work it, uh, work the things in ECS because we haven't you been using Kubernetes yet. But since I know many, maybe some people are Kubernetes users listening to this talk, I will try to bring some uh, dictionary of the, <laughs> translate some terms so it's easier maybe to to have the enter the right mindset when you're to, when we, when I am talking about certain things. This comes from a web page which is links, linked below. So be, bear in mind if it's not really exactly correct what the Kubernetes word. Uh, task definition in ECS, it's like a deployment described by a YAML file in Kubernetes. A task is what uh, Kubernetes is a pod. A container instance uh, is a node and a container agent is a kubelet. This is, these are parts which I am not talking about in this uh, talk because they are basically the management interface uh, which we are not interested to look at today, at least. And then come the uh, confusing part because a service in uh, an ECS is what's called uh, deployment with a controller that keeps it in a desired state in Kubernetes. Because a service in Kubernetes is, uh, as far as I understood, is something different. It's like the load balancer in AWS. So maybe you understand now that the terms are a bit different, but the concept behind it are, are similar. So now that we have the, the goal, we want, uh, we want to scale, we want it, uh, the application to grow, be able to grow, and we want to use Docker in production. Now comes the fun part. We want to containerize our Nails application. Basically, uh, this graph I showed you before, I will focus now on this PHP part of the application. There is the web server and, uh, and we want workers. The goal is that every of these workers can work standalone with, uh, uh, and can process requests without having to know, know about the other nodes, uh, about the other workers. So basically, uh, they have to be isolated and self-contained. It has to contain everything, but it cannot contain stuff that's required to be shared by amongst other workers. So this is the goal that we want to reach to be able to to container to work with containers. Uh, let's let's figure. Probably you using Docker in the development, and what exactly does it mean for you as a developer? You have you have a base image, which is usually a PHP container, a PHP image. You add on some uh, US-specific uh, add-ons for your application in a Docker file. For example, you install PHP extensions, you install um, uh, tools that you require, image magic, graphics magic, everything that your application will require. On top of that, you add your application, which is basically the Neos and Flow code. Um, as soon as you start it up, usually in a development, you uh, either mount it as a volume or uh, this application code, or you sync it from your local machine to this to the to the to the container. Because basically, your application is dynamic when you are when you are developing. And on top, of, on top of that, there is a temporary layer which Docker creates to generate temporary files. So, so if Neos is creating files which are not part of the volumes, uh, it will add them to a temporary layer. Um, so, in order to work um, in a self-contained uh, image, we want to get rid of everything that's uh, local files, local shared files. So, this is one of the parts of the, or in our mission to reach the goal. Get rid of local shared files. We try to and identify uh, some and we, I categorize them in some in certain ways so that we can understand um, so, so that you can take measures in every category. Luckily, Flow has a very nice architecture from start uh, of storage or of, of places where the where the files are being stored. So it's very easy to to split them up into different portions and to cope with them individually. 
it's not a mix of, of files that are generated in a, in a temporary the directory, like in other CMSs. One, of, one part is the caches. We have the persistent caches and we have temporary caches. They are stored usually in a regular flow installation on a file system. Second part is uh, resources, assets, images that the uh, editor adds attached to their, to their pages or PDF files that they upload for the, the users to download. So basically assets are stored in data persistent resources and they are, get, make, are made publicly available through the web resources directory. So we have to get rid of these two st uh, things. And last but not least, logging. Logs are stored locally uh, in these directories, data logs and exception dumps are stored in data log exceptions. We want to get rid of them too. Uh, let's start with the caches. First, we have to go through the list of caches and Flow has a difference, uh, has, luckily it has a cache framework where every individual cache type can be configured separately. This is very good and uh, we can u make use of this. First, we have to categorize and split them up. There are sp application specific and content specific caches. What is an application specific cache? Application specific cache is a cache that depends only on your application, on a PHP code, on a fluid templates, um, and on your fusion code. Uh, so if you change a template, you have a cache where this, this template file is cached. If you have a PHP file, you will most probably have a reflection uh, or an object class um, uh, cache for this PHP file. So these are application specific. They are not specific to the content that you generated. On the other hand, there is the context specific caches. Caches that, which are built and need to be shared amongst different workers because they contain content that is generated, for example, by the user. You add nodes, you access them from the front end, this generates routes, this generates cache entries, the user accesses your pages, uh, it generates session data and session metadata. And there's the Neos Fusion content, which is the biggest and most important cache where your whole content is being cached in different layers. And this is uh, something that's not specific to one particular worker, but to all of them. So all of them have to access them in a shared way. So basically we have the application specific cache which don't, which don't need to be shared because every container, every worker can use the same, uh, its own cache and then the content specific caches, which are only, uh, which are, uh, need to be shared amongst all of them. And it's very easy for the application specific. We add these caches to the Docker container. We keep them in the file system in the Docker container. In front of content specific caches, we use the arrays to have a shared cache for all workers to use in a, uh, in a shared way. And we recommend using the, 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 this package called Sandstorm Optimized Redis Cache Backend, which has some, some improvements for flushing huge, uh, big cache in Redis. And we have, um, so, yeah. Second area, the caching was the first area. The second area is resources, ads, assets. How to deal with that? And this is a very easy <laughs> thing to solve because there is already a solution for that. Just move this whole bunch of files and data persistent to the a cloud object storage, like in AWS, it would be S3. And luckily there is a package available which does its job very well, which is flow native AWS uh, S3. So just install it, configure it, and you're good to go. Third part were logging and exceptions. Uh, for the logging part, maybe you know when you are uh, working locally in a Docker, you can, you can use Docker to display logs too. So we want to use the same systematic to, uh, where, where, that you use locally uh, in, the, in the production environment because ECS and CloudWatch work together. So as soon as our task locks stuff to the Docker logging, so basically to standard out, uh, it will end up in a cloud watch and you will be able to go through these locks from all the tasks that are running. So this is the uh, uh, very easy solution for, to that. Exception files is a different thing because exception files are generated by all workers as individual files. So in our particular case, um, 
if you have exceptions, of course, uh, might be that your application is bug free and you have never exceptions. But ours have some exceptions from time to time and some are maybe even generated through flow itself. But um, I want, we want to just collect them in a central place to be able to analyze them in case we need it. So uh, in this particular case, we have a shared storage, which is an NFS based in, our, in our AWS terms. It's EFS, it's, exp uh, it's their own implementation of NFS, which, can, uh, which containers can mount and store stuff inside there. So we solve this tool, this, this uh, problems too. So now that we don't have any files anymore in our containers, we have a ready to go image. We saw this picture before uh, for the development area, but now we are having a base image, we have our add-ons, we have our application, and we have our warmed up cached, all in one single image. So this is a unit of work that we, can, we, that we could uh, scale up uh, to, to, to run on our production systems. We do the same things for every other service that we want to, uh, to work with in a production. So for a web server, we do the same thing. We have a base image, could be Nginx, we have add-ons, maybe install some plugins, and we have configuration files. Everything that we do here is code, like Docker files and, uh, and files that we can even maintain or manage in, our, in the same place where we manage our application. This is the beauty of it. So let's, let's get over to daily business. Now we have our images and they should run uh, on, uh, in the, uh, for production. But how do we really do that? How do we tell Amazon, please run these containers and in, in, our, in our orchestration or in Kubernetes? In, our, in the ECS way, we start with task definitions. So the bundle that we had before, which is the Neos PHP application and the Nginx, which work together, we combine them in what we call a task definition. In the task definition, this describes not only the images that we want to use, but also some other metadata like memory requirements. How much memory will these containers use? How much uh, CPU will these containers use? And this is bundled in a task definition. We do the same thing for any other service that we want to use. For example, for mail relay, maybe we, want, we create a container that runs Postfix. Maybe we have another mail, mail server that's scalable. And we, design, we define a task definition. Which image, how much memory does it use, which port are, are accessible. This is more or less comparable to a Docker Compose file for every individual uh, service that we want. MySQL is the same thing. We are be running MySQL as containers also for uh, a huge site. It works. Now that we have the task definitions, we have to tell uh, the orchestration system, in our case ECS, uh, how to run this or what do we want to do with this task definition. Basically, we describe a service or we create a service. The service describes, uh, uh, takes a task definition in a particular version, because this task definition can be versioned also. We'll come to that later on. We, t uh, we tell it some health constraints, for example, the minimal amount of tasks you want to start and how many uh, it can grow and, and, and shrink, how many that can we have at, a, at the maximum stage. We decide some entry points like open, uh, open ports, uh, for example, the HTTP, HTTPS ports. Uh, and some settings for the load balancer. How, to, how will the load balancer health check, for example, our, our, our service? And then basically you have a services and you, uh, your Amazon Web Server or your Kubernetes, if you're using it, is able to start your application and run the containers. Now let's talk about how do you co your code or our code in our application uh, is deployed. How can we deploy these containers? And in our particular case, we are using GitHub Actions for that. We are using GitHub for, uh, as, a, as a repository for our code and for reviewing, for pull requests, for making releases and the, the whole infrastructure around the code. And uh, we decided to use also, also GitHub Actions to do the actual deployment. 
but you can of course use any other CI that's available that can do that automatically. For example, Circle CI or uh, in GitLab, there's GitLab CI. So what does the GitHub action exactly do in our particular case? Remember, in our code base, there's not only the code, the Neos application, there's also the task definitions for the tasks that we want, the Docker files for, the, for generating the images and the whole scripting that's required to do that. So in, GitHub, uh, in a GitHub deployment scenario, for example, we make a release and want to deploy to production, the GitHub action does a composer install, basically the, the PHP part of the application building. Um, it builds the front-end artifacts, which is us usually a Node.js uh, application part, doing SAS compilation or fetching Node, node uh, NPM packages and stuff. Then we put that together in an image, building a Docker image, which is the, the image that we talked about before. And we push it to a repository. And of course, AWS offers us a, a Elastic ECR, which is the container registry. And as, as soon as we've pushed it to the repository, uh, to the registry, giving a specific version, we can update our service. We can tell AWS, place AWS service Neos application. I want to update our application to the newest task definition then enters the AWS part. What happens in it? AWS, AWS generates an ECS deployment, which simply denotes uh, what we have now and what we desire, the desired state. What this desired state means, uh, it, it, the ECS is then now responsible to reach this desired state, basically starting containers, stopping existing containers. So uh, it will do it in a gradual way and you can influence it very specifically. How do you want the, the scalability, uh, how do you want to, the deployment to work? Maybe starting just one container and test with the health check if it's, if it's running and, and only then uh, continue uh, rolling out the other containers or just starting uh, them all and then phasing the other ones out. So basically you have a couple of options here and the health check is part of that. As soon as the new tasks are, the desired state is reached, new tasks are running and the old tasks are gone. You can do some cleanup tasks, or maybe clear the cache or, um, or send a mail to the, the release manager or to the, to the customer or finish the deployment in a GitHub Actions because in the GitHub you have also possibility to send events uh, that the de deployment is done. Basically, uh, from a technical point of view, that's it. What's happened? Or for a, this is a more from an abstract point of view. So let's go to a summary. What we've learned. You might have noticed I haven't gone into the details of the code and how it, it works in detail because it would take too much time for today. But if you're interested, in it, we can talk about it later and maybe even in a further uh, workshop or something like that. So if you're interested, just get in touch with me. Summary, what we've learned. Do not give your servers names. Don't treat your servers as pets, where you need to constantly be aware, uh, being scared that they will maybe die. Do not cope. In a container world, you do not care if the container dies because another one is spawned and it works and, it's, and it continues working. So optimize your application and the whole infrastructure to be able to scale horizontally. That's easy. What we learned, you can run a Docker, uh, Neos application with Docker in production in a highly scalable and a, a high access uh, environment. We've done it and others have done it too. We're not the only ones, but uh, it's possible. And you should not be scared of it. You can use AWS ECS because that's why, what we also use, but you can of course use Kubernetes. Probably you have other, other channel challenges to solve there than with ECS, but uh, the challenge is what, what drives us forward, of course. One thing that we learned, infrastructure as part of the code goes well beyond uh, storing the, your web server configuration together with the code. It goes into the, in our case, we, we even store the whole AWS infrastructure as a code built alongside with the application. So this is 
very neat because you have YAML files, you have JSON files, you have Docker files, and everything is versioned and everything can be reviewed and everything can be tested and everything can be deployed in a different, uh, different, different manner, manner. For example, you can have the same deployment infrastructure for your pull request. So you have an open a pull request and you deploy the pull request to a staging uh, Docker environment. Very easy. So and basically, if you like that, a little bit of uh, advertising here, you can contact us. We are looking for people. So if you want to work on this with us, just contact us. So that's it for now. Thanks for your attention. If you have further questions, I will now stop the presentation and the people, the nice people, the presenters from the NEOS conference will take over and moderate a round of question and answers. Thank you. Thank you, Ernesto, for that great overview of what it takes to, uh, to move NEOS to the cloud, to AWS specifically. So um, I think that was quite quite comprehensive, and and I can guess that it's a lot of work open when when you open that Pandora's box of going to the cloud, um, that that you might be overwhelmed. But um, is it worth it? Uh, let's let's ask ask Ernesto directly, and we're connected with Ernesto live in Stuttgart. Hi, how are you doing? Hi. I'm glad to be here with you. Thanks. Nice. I'm, I'm fine. Okay, so after all um, the learning and and all the effort you put into it, uh, was it worth for you um, moving these projects to AWS? Yeah, as you said, it, it was a process because we didn't start it uh, with the first project with everything. But we incrementally uh, from project to project uh, enhanced the way we did our, our infrastructure. And uh, it was worse for us as a developer because everything is now as, is a, as a code and we, we can reproduce it very well. And but also, also uh, it was very, uh, for the last project was also very good for the customer because we have a scalability and the possibility to, to rent cheaper service, which is very good uh, for, the, for the financial part. So you can use the scalability also to to uh, cut some costs. Of course, it comes with the cost of, 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 of implementing everything. So uh, the, 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 the all lessons learned that we had, uh, we now can use for all other projects, of course. But uh, it's, of course, as you say, a Pandora box and everything you, you touch, you, uh, you, 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 you discover other uh, things that you need to, to handle. And then, but uh, it's working very well for us now. Were there specific parts where you or someone in your team kind of regretted like, oh, that was so so much easier before we moved to the cloud? It can you name something which was unexpectedly difficult? Yeah, some things uh, are we uh, we get used to, like uh, you SSH to uh, uh, the machine and do stuff there. Mm -hmm. And maybe even patch a, a PHP file from time to time. Uh, it happens, and developers did it, or DevOps did it. And uh, then we tell them, no, there is no PHP file you can touch because there are several containers, and uh, the containers have the code. If you want to change something, you have to rebuild the image and redeploy it. And uh, so it has to some parts and of the development process has to change the mindset because it's not so easy anymore to to really uh, manipulate things directly on the server like we did before, which was hacky anyway, so we got rid of it, but uh, uh, you have to, we still have an SSH container. That's, uh, that's uh, interesting because we still do, we can do management jobs uh, doing an SSH to a specific container, but this is totally independent of the other container. So uh, you have the same code, uh, you can SSH, you can do flow help and flow node repair if you want, but uh, you have to think, uh, you have to understand it, and the developers that are working with it have to understand it. But as soon as you get, uh, you lose the scare of it, of having the containers, and uh, you start working and, and it works, and you start using the tools that work with it, and you, it's like getting to it at first that you are maybe overwhelmed and uh, you, you don't trust it, that, and you make backups of first, and, and, and then as soon as you start learning and using the tools, you get more confident that it works, and. That it's uh, that it's also yeah beautiful to work with. 
How, how would you like is Nea suited for for that kind of setup? I mean, um, maybe also com compared with other PHP applications, you know, or other applications you tried it with. Yeah, we've done it before for uh, Node.js applications, which uh, also works pretty well. And uh, since we built them from start uh, with that knowledge uh, or to, to be run in containers, it was easy also to, to do that in our standalone applications. Mm. Uh, for Neos, it was pretty, uh, as you mentioned before in my talk, uh, it comes already with an architecture that and uh, that it's, uh, it's very easy to to, to put into the cloud or into Docker containers. Mm. I am the, my next step, because we are still running a type of three projects, would be to put the same knowledge, uh, use the same knowledge to uh, put it also for, for type of three projects into action. Mm -hmm. And I think there are some things that uh, could work very well, but uh, maybe there are some other pitfalls or Pandora boxes <laughs> <laughs> because it's not uh, thought from the ground up in, with this way, but it's getting better and better. So maybe mm. it's also it could be possible too. Yeah, nice. Is that, uh, I think you mentioned that you have a setup where um, you can automate, if there's a pull request, you can spin up a staging environment to, to review the result basically of the, of the build uh, application. Is that something that you're doing in, in your projects and which worked well so that you're doing it for all of your projects now? Every time there's a pull request, it spins up a, a cloud instance? Yeah, that it's also a process because we the the, the latest pro, pro, uh, projects we are using like uh, this this scenario like this with like I explained with ECS and and GitHub builds, but we have uh, other projects where we do similar things with other technologies without containers or using our GitLab servers. So we have different uh, stages of of development. I think in this latest uh, state that we are now, we are not finished. We are still working and and getting more. Uh, it's it's a it's a endless process. I think you can <laughs> and, uh, new technologies come in, and you have to uh, get uh, like uh, uh, Robert mentioned the flux uh, uh, technology that I will take a look at, and with Kubernetes maybe would be the next step to be more open to other uh, uh, architectures because maybe AV AWS is not an option for uh, for everybody. So we are constantly upgrading, but we are using that uh, for for this particular project, this this approach, and uh, yeah, we are. Uh, uh, yeah, people don't miss it. Uh, uh, Will miss it if it's not there for future projects or, the, or developers or also customers. Yeah, and the customer. That's that's an interesting question. Um, are the do the customers understand this concept of okay? Th there's a specific feature, and this you know this the staging system you're looking at right now has this specific feature. If you're looking in, at another staging uh, setup, then that feature will not be there. Th there's another feature there. Is that easy to convey to customers? It's it's not uh, so easy for every customer, but the customer that accompany, uh, that's uh, coming with us with this process, he got used to the new the new way of working, and uh, I think it depends. I would say <laughs> on the customer, <laughs> we have to uh, think about uh, what can we dare to show the customer if it's if they are overwhelmed by multiple URLs for every pull request one URL. We we can uh, we usually do an integration branch where we mm -hmm. uh, deploy this integration branch then to our setup where, with everything in place because usually it's not only the code that's important to uh, to to be tested but also the what what content do we show so we, uh, do we want to have a replica of the live content with a new a new code or do we have a our demo content which we usually uh, maintain uh, with the code uh, is it sufficient so it depends on what the customer needs to or wants to see <laughs> or for a for a new feature mm -hmm. to to test a new feature, yeah. So I everything mean, is possible, but uh, yeah. yeah. So v very often people start thinking about uh, moving to the cloud for scalability reasons, also as as you mentioned in the title of the talk. Um, but sometimes it also goes beyond that. I mean, you already mentioned that that flexibility of having previews uh, of new features and so on. Um, do you think there are other um, other aspects of uh, of the cloud which uh, benefit for your work compared to traditional physical servers you you had before yeah of course the the benefits of uh, scalability is one of course but uh, availability is another one important one because in aws you if you select a region you can uh, 
deployed to multiple availability zones, which are separated uh, physically also. For example, in Frankfurt, they have uh, three different availability zones. You can say, uh, I want to host my application uh, throughout these applications to have uh, availability, even if one of them goes down or if the routing is broken mm -hmm. or something like that. And also the internationalization possibility. So if you want to host the same application in multiple regions, for example, in China or in South America due to latency of the network, it's easily possible with this blocks of uh, building blocks because you have can use the same uh, the same infrastructure. Just switch a variable, say not or not EU Central, but uh, South America, Sao Paulo, for example, <laughs> and it and start it up, and uh, you just pay, of course, uh, as you go. Yeah. Oh, by the way, um, when you, when you mentioned uh, exceptions and in flow. Um, that that they could be uh, stored, for example, in NFS. There's also another um, solution uh, you know about, um, which is Sentry, which I can really recommend. Uh, a Sentry service, uh, which is an either software as a service or self-hosted. Um, and there's also there are also Nails plugins. I also created one, which you could use, and then exceptions end up centrally stored. That's very helpful for these cases. Yeah, I, 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 I looked at it already, but uh, never tried it. I, good, good hint. I could do it. So many tools, so few time. I, <laughs> I know, I know. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ernesto, uh, for giving us, sharing your insights into Docker, uh, AWS and NEOS and how all of them can uh, yeah, benefit from each other and how you can build a highly performant uh, NEOS setups uh, with the cloud. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for having me, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and you're doing it very well, and uh, yeah, good finishing line now. It's, it's the finishing line already, so have fun. Thank you very Bye. much.